whites are, are, uh -huh. are deeper. And then all of these lines that are intersecting across here um, was an old uh, coordinate system that they used that was shore-based, so it was Loran C. So that's, we ended up converting all those original location numbers to GPS. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. So, uh, hello, my name is Vasilios Kuzmakos. Today is February 4th, 2022. I'm here with my coworker Adolfo Romero. And we're with the Samuel Proctor World History Program. Who do we have the pleasure of speaking with today? Um, Patrick Schwing. Well, hello, Dr. Schwing. Um, if you can kind of just start off by telling me um, what your position is, right, where you grew up, that type of thing. Sure. Uh, so, my position is an assistant professor here at Eckerd College. Um, I originally was born in Denver, Colorado, uh, was, stayed there pretty much my entire childhood. And then I actually came down to St. Petersburg, Florida to attend Eckerd College, uh, graduated from here in 2006. So, and then, um, yeah, I went to the University of South Florida College of Marine Science after that, uh, defended my dissertation, my PhD in 2011, and then uh, worked at USF primarily on Deepwater Horizon oil spill related research for about a decade, <laughs> and then uh, got a job back here at Eckerd uh, just a few years ago. Fantastic. And how did you end up finding St. Petersburg from Colorado? How did you go there? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> I uh, you know, lived in Colorado, a landlocked state. Um, every time I got a chance to go out and see the beach, I was absolutely fascinated. I don't think that's totally abnormal. A lot of the marine scientists that I meet are usually from Iowa, Ohio, you know, Midwest, that kind of thing. Really? Um, so it's, you know, it's the allure of something different. <laughs> but um, I remember one, one memory, uh, you know, we were up in the mountains hiking with my, uh, my mom. And uh, I saw, you know, a, a mollusk shell embedded in the rock. And so she told me at that point, she's like, well, at one time, you know, this was all under the ocean. And that got me thinking. I was like, "Wait a second! How does you know? How does something that's you know hundred or thousands of feet high, you know, how is that once under the under the seafloor, uh, or on the seafloor?" Um, and so, that's really what you know started my my interest in trying to figure out marine environments and geo geological history and that kind of thing. Um, so, probably ten or eleven years old or so, I really dedicated myself to wanting to study the marine environment. Um, and I talked to my high school guidance counselor and. Eckerd, I think, was number seven at the time, ranked as like the best undergraduate schools for marine science. Um, and it was one of the few on the East Coast, too. So I came down here, I took a tour, I fell in love, and I wanted to come here. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, yeah. it's such a beautiful canvas where you're on the water. I mean, it's hard not to fall in love with it, right? Yeah, yeah. So uh, um, tell us a little bit about your research, right? So what was your PhD thesis on? That type of thing? Sure. Uh, my PhD thesis focused um, almost entirely on the watershed of the Manatee River here in Tampa Bay. Mm -hmm. um, so that the when it, Manatee River empties into Tampa Bay, so we have a, a transect of seafloor sediment samples, um, you know, basically just mud at the bottom of the seafloor, um, all the way from the Manatee River Dam out to the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and it was kind of a threefold focus. The first was just looking at um, particulate matter, how much sediment was going to be deposited over time. Um, and we found that over the course from about 1900 to the year 2000, that had increased by a factor of 10. Um, so the bulk amount of stuff being, you know, uh, emitted into the river had increased by a factor of 10, which sounds like a lot. <clears throat> it is a lot, but it's fairly common in coastal areas that have been heavily developed. Um, so with human development usually comes a lot of material, right, going down the river uh, and into the bay. <clears throat> the second part was looking at um, trace element concentrations, basically that along those histories. Um, we have some really clear records of like leaded gasoline. You know, you can see it increase throughout the 50s, 60s, 70s, and then all of a sudden you have the Clean Water Act and they're phasing out the catalytic converters, that type of thing, and you can see it decrease uh, over the last 20 to 30 years. So that's actually a positive sign, right? We can actually see that some, you know, uh, you know working with private industry, working with, with uh, legislators, we can actually affect some positive change in our waterways, right? Um, some others were a little bit m more interesting. So we have a lot of uh, copper contamination, uh, which tends to be during large storms. Uh, so if the Manatee River Dam floods, they have to release a lot of the water. Um, that typically will stir up some of the bottom. Uh, along with all the stuff on the bottom comes some of those contaminants that were previously at the bottom of the reservoir. And that goes down river and into the bay. Um, what was the other one? Let's see, that was copper. We also found a lot of arsenic. Um, and so arsenic was common in a lot of um, uh, pesticides that were used you know, usually mid-century 1900s. Um, what's really interesting is, is that we still see high concentrations in some cases right at the surface, so still available you know, to some of the organisms that are living on the seafloor. And we think what's happening is, is that um, you had, you know, the Manatee River watershed was predominantly agricultural land for a long time in the 1900s, right? 
Um, and then 1950s, 60s, uh, you had a lot of movement of rural development into those pasture lands and, and crop fields. Um, and so with that comes, you know, you're going to stir up a lot of that material, it's going to go down into the river as well. And that's been continuously sort of resuspended and emitted into the river and the bay uh, as our, our urban development has expanded. So almost like a ticking time bomb, right? So all of this material is kind of stuck on the bottom for decades, right? And then just through natural kind of weathering and erosion, right, you can just ends up on the surface again and kind of starts contaminating our waters. Is that, would you say that's accurate? Yeah, some of, some of it can be resuspended. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, if uh, large dredging projects will do that, um, and they they have very highly regulated mitigation strategies to minimize the impact. Mm -hmm. um, you know, most of what I was looking at is resuspension on land. So then, you know, if you're, if you're digging up soil that's been, you know, buried for several decades, uh, and, you know, that has those layers of high arsenic or copper layers in it, um, you know, to develop it for a, a housing project or something like that. That can all be during a storm washed, you know, into the river or into the bay. So, yes, I mean, our, our activities on land greatly impact our waterways, greatly impact our coastal uh, coastal water zones. So with your PhD thesis, right, you're kind of looking specifically at the Manti River, right, which is kind of more estuarine environment, right? Now your more contemporary research, right, has to do with oil spills, right, has to do with eDNA, that type of thing. So discuss kind of that transition in terms of interest, you know, sure. those two projects. Yeah, um, I was just finishing up my dissertation at USF uh, when the Deepwater Horizon oil spill happened. Uh, so just by happenstance, our, our local um, research vessels that we use are run by the Florida Institute of Oceanography, which are housed at USF College of Marine Science. Um, and so I was working hand in hand with those folks to try and respond, the scientific response, to get those vessels out there and take as many samples as we could in real time. Um, so all, at the surface, you know, throughout the water column, and then of course with my expertise with seafloor measurements, we were focused on how much oil actually made it to the seafloor. Um, so that was, it was really being in the right place at the right time. Um, and they asked me to stay on at USF uh, as a postdoc, um, postdoctoral research uh, position. Um, because there was, uh, you know, a lot of work to be done with the Deepwater Horizon. So I stayed on there from 2000, uh, yeah, defended in 2011, stayed there until 2019. So the oil, right, that um, oil tends to be on the surface, right, goes down, hits the bottom, right. Um, why is that problematic? So <clears throat> one of the, the key findings from the Deepwater Horizon that was unexpected, uh, you know, the common understanding is oil's less dense than water, it'll float, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, what ended up happening, there were two actually, I shouldn't, shouldn't say there's only one, there were two findings that, was, that were really interesting in the deep water scenario, right? You're a mile deep, you've got this really complex, what they call live oil mixture of gas and petroleum, liquid petroleum. And it's being emitted from the, the well, right, under pressure, which is really warm, really high pressure, uh, into a relatively low pressure, very low temperature system, right? So a lot of really complex chemical and physical reactions are happening. So what ended up happening was is that a lot of the oil came out, you can kind of picture like a, a spray paint can, you know, faced upward, <laughs> coming out of the wellhead. Um, a lot of the, the, the liquid petroleum actually reached uh, neutral buoyancy before it got to the surface, and it started spreading out laterally. So we had these plumes or intrusions kind of spreading out, you know, at about 1,000 meters or about 3,000 feet deep. Um, and so that actually would impinge, it, it affects all the fish and, and all the invertebrates that live at those depths, but it also impinged or came in contact with the seafloor at those depths too in many areas. So that's what we were trying to find out is where it actually made contact. Um, I think for a broader impact statement, the, the second process is probably more impactful. So once all of this oil made it to the surface, uh, it started interacting with particles from the Mississippi River. So just, you know, clay particles that were in the water floating. Uh, and it also started, you know, eliciting a stress response from all the critters that live in the surface ocean. So phytoplankton, zooplankton, bacteria, a lot of those organisms release as a stress response when they are near something they don't want to be, uh, this really sticky substance that kind of coat themselves in this gel. Um, and so what, that acted like a glue, right? So the, the oil particles and the particles from the Mississippi River all glommed on to the biological uh, you know, cells essentially, and that all became these long, sinuous, kind of snotty looking uh, flocculent material. Um, at, over the course of a few hours, that usually gets fairly heavy and dense and starts to sink. Um, so that became what's known as a really long acronym. It's Marine Oil Snow Sedimentation and Flocculent Accumulation, M-O-S-S-F-A, MOSFA. We originally called it the Dirty Blizzard, <laughs> colloquially, right? 
Um, and so that blanketed uh, the, the seafloor of the Gulf of Mexico in an area that's about the size of Maryland. Um, so whether it was contaminated with oil or not, and to what degree, uh, you know, we have a gradient, but the, the overall spatial coverage um, of all of that marine oil snow material was about the size of Maryland. Another, so. um, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but when they were initially trying to address the oil spill, right, they kind of had a bunch of different issues, right, they were experimenting with. Something that they tried to do is that they, if I remember correctly, was that uh, they tried to essentially sink the oil, right, using a certain chemical. Am I correct about that? Yeah, so that in addition to the oil contamination, they also added about 800,000 gallons of uh, Corexit dispersants, right? Um, and so those are basically surfactants. They want to break the oil, large oil particles into smaller ones, um, which is all well and good. I mean, a lot of times the smaller particles are easier for bacteria to degrade, right? It creates more surface area. Um, and in many cases, that, that was effective, um, at least at the surface. Uh, there's still debate, although several of the published uh, papers out there would say that it was, was effective. There's still debate as to whether um, they also injected those dispersants uh, at the wellhead at 1,500 meters, um, so about a mile deep. Um, there's a lot of debate as to whether that was actually effective at dispersing the oil in, in place or not. Um, and so that, that debate will probably continue. But uh, at the surface, it was fairly, you know, um, fairly effective. Uh, the only challenge to the efficacy of those dispersants is that um, some of the, uh, the chemicals that the oil is composed of you know, in smaller and smaller droplets and smaller and smaller pieces, they actually become more toxic because um, they can be ingested by more and more organisms. Um, and so if you're not a microbe that's breaking those compounds down, uh, let's say you're a fish or you're a shrimp, something like that, those smaller droplets, those smaller uh, size fractions of oil can actually become more toxic. Um, more, so it's a bit of a trade-off, yeah. More toxic in terms of like, you know, a small shrimp is going to ingest a small clump of oil, for example, right? That's going to build up in cells, and then the bioaccumulation is going to result in the food chain. Is that accurate? Yeah, so one of the, the issues that we had with the Deepwater Horizon is that uh, for a lot of the organisms in the, in the Gulf, and for many of the ecosystems in the Gulf, we didn't have baseline measurements prior to the oil spills. We didn't know what normal was, really, for, for a lot of it. Um, so we had to use, uh, we had to start making measurements in 2010 and then see which way they went. You know, was it a positive change? Was it a negative change? Um, one of the major challenges with not having baselines, more uh, germane to your question, is that what we saw, especially in some of the larger fish, it wasn't necessarily like a mortality uh, issue, right? It was either, they were usually sublethal effects. So their size wouldn't be you know, as large as they were prior to, to this spill if we had data for them. Um, or if you know, we saw them gradually get bigger after the spill, which we interpret as you know, an increase, something's recovering, right? Um, the other thing that we saw were skin lesions. So my colleague, Steve Murawski, uh, published a paper on this in 2014, looking at the frequency of skin lesions um, in predominantly red snapper. And their, their argument is, is that you know, if, um, if the fish is healthy, they're usually able to stave off any sort of infection on their skin or under their scales. But if they're stressed by an oil spill or any other stressor, um, their, their body is essentially attributing a lot of energy to, to dealing with that toxic, right? And they're not able to fend off any other sort of stressor, bacterial infection, that kind of thing. So we saw a lot of, a lot of skin lesions in 2010, 11, and it, they gradually trailed off. They gradually decreased in the northern Gulf of Mexico over about the course of about five years. And you said this is a result of the stress that the oil contaminants put in the ecosystem, or specifically the fish, right? That's our interpretation of it, yep. Interesting. Yep. And so then, um, so the, not talking about the direct impacts that, that, that oil is having on bathing organisms, right? So the gulf, right, I think is usually composed of soft corals, right, um, and then sandy bottom, right? But a lot of our kind of big species are goliath groupers or, you know, a lot of our game fish, right, kind of rely on these kind of areas for food, you know, um, shelter, et cetera. What direct impact did this did the sinking of oil have on some of the bottom? Because from my understanding, some of these areas were completely like, became like deserts after the fact, right? Yeah. So the the seafloor of the Gulf of Mexico and a lot of the deep sea in general um, can be fairly patchy. It's a lot. It's really dependent upon food from above. So all the organisms, most of the organisms that live there, are completely dependent upon stuff naturally falling from the, the sea surface. Mm -hmm. um, what we saw after the, the Deepwater Horizon was, um, you know, in some ways you can think of that marine oil snow as a 
huge food source, right? So there are a lot of microbes in the Gulf of Mexico that, are, that live along natural seeps that eat oil, right? That's their primary food source. So the, the Gulf of Mexico is actually primed oh, really? microbially to degrade oil. So that was one of the cool things. I mean, that was one of the, the neat findings, right? Um, if, if you get into some of the larger size fractions, like some of the forams that I work with, some of the larger worms and uh, bivalves and things that people normally associate with, with organisms that live on the seafloor, it's a different story. So if you have a, you know, an accumulation of just this blanket of, of marine oil snow, um, not only is there oil in it, so you might have some direct toxic effects, um, but it also is a blanket, so it's actually going to draw down the oxygen. Um, and it might also be a physical barrier, right? Some of the really small ones may not be able to get to the top of it because it happens so quickly. Um, and so as you have all those microbes, you know, degrading the oil and degrading the other organic material, the, the phytoplankton and zooplankton in that layer, um, they're respiring. They're using up the oxygen that would normally be there on the seafloor uh, to a greater degree than they would be normally. So it's kind of a double whammy. Um, you know, the organisms, like I mentioned before, are called foraminifera that I work with. Uh, and we saw them responding to two different stressors related to the oil spill, that, that you know, marine oil snow deposition. One was the direct toxicity, right? They were, they were suffering from an area that was, had higher concentrations of oil than they had seen previously. Um, the other one was that drawdown in oxygen. And it turns out that that, that decrease in oxygen was actually a longer term effect than the direct toxicity of the oil. Um, as far as we know right now, the uh, the time it took for them after 2010 when the oil spill occurred to get to some new normal. And again, we don't have baselines, so we don't know what the previous normal was, but some level of stasis where all of our indicators aren't going up and down significantly um, took about three to five years. Uh, and most of that time, they were responding to that decreased oxygen on the seafloor. Yeah, so kind of discuss the anaerobic kind of conditions, right, or um, that you've kind of mentioned a little bit, right? So, um, just kind of elaborate a little bit about what you said. So why is it important and, uh, what it, and discuss the impacts of that a little bit more? Sure. Um, so, yeah, I mean, naturally, there are certain areas of the ocean that are naturally anoxic. Very little oxygen right at the seafloor surface, right, between the water column and the seafloor. Um, and so what we had to do at that time was to kind of use those as analogs. We looked at the organisms that lived there, what type of, of uh, specific species liked that type of area. Um, and we were able to compare those to some of the areas that we saw what we thought was an impact, right, uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and it turns out that there were some, some real corollaries there, right? There are some opportunistic species that like low oxygen environments. And we saw those, the, the relative abundance of those increased after the oil spill, up to about two to three years. And then all of a sudden it started transitioning to what we, we were calling the new normal, the new spaces level where things are not changing much, where things are a little bit more equitable. Um, there are more species right present, um, and those species we know are not necessarily uh, preferring areas of low oxygen, right? So, and, you know, you kind of mentioned stasis, right? I mean, are you kind of, um, I mean, at least contemporarily, kind of we are. Um, are we seeing kind of more upward trends of kind of what we would imagine the prior normal would be, or do we just have zero idea whatsoever? So, do you understand what I'm saying? Um, so, do we understand the primary role of those organisms? So. This whole, so this homeostasis had existed, right, mm -hmm. after three mm -hmm. to five years, right? It's been about 10 years now, right? So it's like, are we, are, are we kind of seeing more of a, are we, are, seeing, are we seeing more of an upward kind of mobility in terms of like regrowth and that type of thing? I oh, I see, yeah. yeah. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, yeah so um, it depends on which organism you're looking at. <laughs> it really does. Uh, so yeah, I'll start with forams because I'm the most familiar with those, but I recently published a paper with several other experts in different uh, classes of organisms on the seafloor. So I can tell you a little about what we found there. Um, so as far as the forams are concerned... Uh, Actually, before you begin, just explain yeah. to us what forams are. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, for, so I apologize. <laughs> yeah. Foraminifera, we've got a couple of models here if we want to you know, show them for the, the camera. Here we go. So these are, these are large scale models of foraminifera, they are uh, calcium carbonate, so calcite shells. They're usually about the size of a, uh, the tip of your uh, pencil, right? They're microscopic most of the time, so these are much larger than the actual ones, but they're good for, uh, for show and tell. Um, and uh, they are extremely diverse. Um, so they, some of them live on the seafloor, some of them live uh, up at the, the sea surface that are, you know, the planktonic ones. 
um, and they're extremely diverse, so they're really useful as uh, ecological indicators. So we know which ones, uh, you know, are, prefer which types of environments. So if you're able to set up a monitoring program, right, and measure things from year to year, or month to month, um, you can see the, the general change between the ones that like low oxygen or high oxygen or, you know, a, a pristine environment or a degraded environment. So they're really useful in that respect. Um, but yeah, is that a good enough intro? Yeah, okay, cool. <laughs> yeah, they're um, yeah useful useful organisms. Um, but they they took about three to five years to reach what we what we think of as a stasis level. Uh, since then, from 2015 to present, um, what we've seen is, is there are certain sites in the Gulf of Mexico where the communities that we did have some baselines for are different, still statistically different than they were prior to 2010. So we have not fully recovered yet, um, and. The question is, will we ever? I don't know. Those communities may stay the way they are until the next major stressor comes through. Um, so I, I, what I'm saying is, is that it's likely a new normal for many of those locations. Um, some of them are statistically similar to prior. So some of them have fully recovered, but many have not. Um, with regard to other organisms, we looked at some of the other same size organisms, the microscopic organisms. Uh, we, with colleagues, we looked at some of the other larger ones, the worms, the, the, the clams and bivalves, those types of things, uh, all the way up to the larger organisms like the red crabs um, and uh, corals as well. And we found that uh, as you go from the microbial populations, the really small stuff, all the way up to the larger stuff, the corals especially, um, they're typically longer lived, right? They live a lot longer lifetime, lifespan, um, and they're typically slower growing. Um, and so if you factor both of those things in, generally we saw a recovery period that increased with both size and longevity. Um, and so current models uh, suggest that the corals, uh, for them, mainly the, the impacts that we saw were, were branch loss. So the branches would die and break off, right? Um, for them to regrow those branches to pre-Deepwater Horizon levels would take anywhere between 10 and 30 years wow. um, from 2015, right? <laughs> um, and then others have argued that for the entire system to recover, you need to bury that contaminated layer before or below the zone where organisms live in the sediments, right? Um, and so we have to take, take into account how long it takes for those oil compounds to break down we have to take into account the burial rates, how much stuff is coming into the system over time. Um, and when you and we also have to take into account how deep organisms are stirring things up in the sediments, right? So putting all three of those things together, uh, we calculated that somewhere between 50 and 100 years from now, that layer will be buried below, will be fully remediated outside of the area where it might be actually stirred up again. Well, so that long, 50, 100 years for essentially things to for essentially, essentially for things to go back before BP. Right. Right, and um, just to kind of remind us, right, BP having what, 20, 2010, right? Or, 2010. Yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that, so you kind of discussed all the history behind that, right? So, you know, it's, um, and you kind of touched upon this, but it's 2022, right? Why does it still matter um, to our fisheries and to everything else? Sure. Um, so right now we're actually working with uh, folks here at Eckerd. Uh, we were funded by the National Science Foundation to go out and take more collections at these uh, certain areas that we've been sampling since 2010. And we had returned, starting in 2010, we were basically went once a year, uh, every time. And we combined uh, efforts for seafloor sampling, so that's the mud fraction of it. <laughs> and then we also had uh, folks, Steve Morawski at USF, uh, and his team uh, sampling fish during the daytime. So we used to call these the mud and blood cruises because um, they were sampling fish. We were sampling mud from the seafloor. Um, and it worked to our advantage of because we could actually pair the seafloor with the water column, right? Um, and we actually saw a lot of connectivity because a lot of the fish that they're catching were dependent upon the seafloor resources, right, either for food or structure. Um, so we saw a lot of continuation there, or uh, continuity there, you know, um, and congruity with their response curves. So the skin lesions and the forams, for example, recovered on about the same time frame. So we're looking at three to five years for the system to get back to stasis. Why does it matter that we go, you know, we're what, 12 years out? <laughs> um, this, this new grant from NSF, uh, we're trying to train up young geoscientists um, and we're trying to, you know, 
broaden participation. Uh, so we're going to ultimately try and diversify the, the, the geoscience um, workforce. Um, but by doing that, we're actually having them work on continuing this time series in the Gulf of Mexico. So we're returning to all of these sites that we've gone to year after year after year. One of the primary reasons that we want to go back is that we, don't, we still don't know what, like I said, what normal was or what the new normal is. Um, so after 2015, when I said you know, we'd reached that kind of stasis level, um, you know, there were a few gaps in, the, in our collections just due to funding. Uh, and so now we want to go back and see, all right, well, you know, what is natural variability, right? If that increase that we saw as sort of the new normal or stasis level, is that within natural variability or not, right? Do we see natural variability being very, very small? And the perturbations that we saw at Deepwater Horizon was a very large one. Um, or is that perturbation within natural variability, right? With all of the other stressors that we have going on in the Gulf of Mexico, um, it's really important to keep these long-term time series collections going, monitoring efforts essentially, uh, to try and disentangle the impacts from a deep water horizon event versus a, maybe a coastal hurricane event versus ocean acidification or warming, right? Um, there's a lot of different things going on in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, and so we're, we're trying to, to yeah, basically disentangle all of those different stressors along with natural variability. Yeah, that was one of my questions actually. Uh, based on like natural disasters or just like uh, hurricanes on its own, would that like stir the ground or how would that impact like the, I'm guessing with the oil, like getting stuck at the bottom or would that like bring back out more oil into the forefront of the ocean or? In the, in the coastal areas, yeah. I mean, even the largest hurricanes uh, don't disturb more than I think about 50 meters. So 150, 200 feet of, of the water column. So a lot of the sites that we're monitoring are much, much deeper. Um, we're down at somewhere between 200 and 2,000 meters, right? So well, well outside where uh, hurricanes might potentially resuspend the bottom. That being said, um, you know, there was a decent amount of oil deposited in those coastal zones that are shallower than 50 meters or so, right? Um, and so some of those areas that material probably was deposited and remained could potentially be stirred up again by a hurricane. Um, you know, a lot of it also seeped into, uh, you know, sea, um, not seagrass beds, but salt marshes, uh, mangrove systems, that type of thing. Um, and those areas especially, um, you know, it's easier, not easier, better in many cases to kind of let them remediate in place, let that oil stay. Because if you go in there and try and tear everything up and clean it up, you may do more harm than good. Um, and so a lot of the oil actually does still remain as a layer maybe partially buried. Some of it's still right at the surface in a lot of the, um, the salt marshes in Louisiana, some of the mangroves, uh, you know, some of the mangrove coastlines just north of us here. Um, so a lot of those, you know, if, if a storm comes through, could potentially stir those back up again. Yeah. Uh, right now at the moment, are there still any restrictions like where fishermen cannot uh, go out and fish or because of oil or anything like that? Um, not Other? currently. I mean, not, not because of the Deepwater Horizon. No, that was the, the uh, yeah, the, the restrictions on fishing were relatively short-lived. Um, so as of 2011, I mean, you were able to, to pretty much fish most areas, at least out in the, the open Gulf of Mexico. There were coastal areas that were heavily uh, polluted still at the time that had to go through the full remediation process, but those have since opened. But I would imagine, that, like, kind of like we've been talking about, right, the impact of the had on the Bethic kind of organisms, right, that, you know, such a Foundation, that's the foundation to the entire food chain, right? So mm. I would imagine that has had a pretty significant impact on commercial fisheries. Um, can you speak a bit more about that? Or? Yeah, I can speak a little bit about it. Yeah. Um, so one silver lining of all this is now we have a lot more information than we did about the Gulf of Mexico, right? I mean, this was kind of a natural experiment or a not so natural experiment. <laughs> um, but now we do have, we're establishing baselines, right? We do have baselines for the, the organisms that live on the seafloor that provide, as you said, the base of the food chain. Um, and we've sort of layered those, those baselines together all the way up to some of the larger fish, right, that we like to catch and eat, snappers, groupers, those types of things. And so I mentioned earlier how we saw some overlap in the contaminated areas and the response between the seafloor, some of those larger fish that are dependent upon the seafloor. Um, so yeah, as far as... Um, large-scale fisheries, and I'm not a fisheries expert, but I work with some of, some of the best in the world, um, I can speak to what they've found. So, I mean, Steve Murawski's group particularly, uh, Will Patterson's group from actually University of Florida now, um, they both have found issues with uh, si so size classes, age classes, 
where the year from 2000, or I should say the group from the year 2010, 11, and 12 were generally um, smaller, right? And there were generally fewer of them for those two or three years. Uh, and then after that, from what I know, from what I've seen them publish, those size classes have come up a little bit, or those year classes have, have, have increased in size. Um, and so again, that's another sign of recovery on the order of three or four, or maybe five years later. So you kind of mentioned that there's a lot going on, on the Gulf of Mexico, right? So speaking of things that are going on, right? Red tide, right? Mm -hmm. The elephant room type of thing. So uh, um, some of your research has to do with that, right? Can, would you mind discussing some of that? Yeah, yeah. So we just got started. Um, we're working on a collaborative project with the Fish and Wildlife Commission, so Fish, Fish and Wildlife uh, Research Institute here in St. Petersburg. Yeah. Um, and we're working with their harmful algal bloom group. So. Uh, they have an ongoing, and have for like the last two or three years, uh, an ongoing monitoring program uh, on five stations off the coast from Tampa Bay. So the main shipping channel, just north of the main shipping channel, out into the Gulf. Um, and they primarily look at the, the sea surface and the water column. And so they called upon us to try and couple seafloor measurements into the water column. So we can kind of you know, paint on the bottom of the box, so to speak, in the conceptual model. Um, and so we've got three primary objectives with them. Um, starting sort of historically, we're going out to take short sediment cores, so basically just pushing tubes into the seafloor, pulling out sediments, um, and we can basically, again, just like I said in the Manatee River, use them as a historical record. So the uppermost sediments are the most recent, the bottom sediments are the longest to go, and we can date them. Um, so we know which layers were occurring when. And then we pull specific things out. So foraminifera being one, good indicator of what benthic health was like, right? We can see how healthy the environment was over time. Um, but the most important part of that is looking at uh, any accumulation or any record of the organism that causes harmful algal blooms here. So Carinia brevis, it's a dinoflagellate is what they call it. Um, so we're interested in, in the, the magnitude and the longevity of past harmful algal blooms, right? Uh, especially prior to human development. Um, you know, did they occur naturally? We think so. Um, have they been exacerbated by increased nutrient loading from human activities? That's one of the questions we don't really know the answer to, right? Um, over the long term, right? So that's one of the things that we'd like to do, is put all of those records together uh, in one place right here off, off West Florida. Um, secondly, we're interested in looking at, very closely related, uh, seafloor impacts from harmful algal blooms, right? So when a, when a bloom happens, use foraminifera as bioindicators of health. If we see any of those indicators decrease, uh, then we know that it was likely because of the harmful algal bloom, right? Um, and then last but not least, so we're calibrating that right now. <laughs> we have one year of data, once a month uh, collections, and we're trying to calibrate that right now. The, the third one, um, there is a, an organism that blooms very similarly. It's, it's, really, it's closely related to the organism that blooms here, uh, Carinia brevis, um, and it's Carinia Mickey motoi. So it's a very yeah, closely related dinoflagellate organism uh, that blooms in Southeast Asia. So China, South China Sea, that type of thing. Um, and they know that that organism uh, can go dormant. So it basically creates a little cyst, a little hard outer package, and can basically sink to the bottom and hang out until conditions are, are favorable for them again. Uh, when that happens, if there's enough nutrients or the temperature or the oxygen is right, they'll basically come out of that, that okay. cyst and come back up into the water column. Um, and so what we're trying to figure out now is what um, significance does the seafloor have with that initiation period, right? Does it purely initiate from, do, do our harmful algal blooms on the West Florida Shelf behave similarly where they initiate from the seafloor um, and maybe terminate on the seafloor once they all go dormant again, right? Fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> There's no way no animals eat them at the bottom of the floor. Uh, I guess when they try to hide in under, um, are there, do they eat them or no? So I think um, organisms that are they're called detritivores that will just kind of rummage through all of the material that's on the seafloor. Okay. No, they probably the ingest them, oh, okay. sure, um, but not intentionally. Okay. Um, so I don't, I mean, we don't know, but I don't foresee that being any issue with you know uh, toxicity up the food chain okay. or up the food web. So just to understand what you're saying, right? Some some of the things that cause red tide, right? Um, this type of algae that you mentioned sinks to the bottom, right, and 
kind of just lies dormant essentially until things are kind of right for it to happen again. Right, obviously, right, um, you know, right side occurs naturally, right, because of nutrients, right. Um, there's a possibility, like you're saying, that it's caused by excessive nutrients from human activity. Um, so, th I guess I'm trying to ask is, uh, you know, like I said, it kind of almost reminds me of, kind of what you were saying about the nutrients earlier, right? Where it's like, you know, kind of have these taking time bombs that kind of exist, right? Because of our past behavior and that are kind of just waiting to bite us in the buzz, you know, a couple years later if we don't act correctly. Would you see that accurate? Um, yeah, I think, you know, um, I, I would say that <laughs> we're, we're learning quite a bit more than we have ever known about the organism that causes red tide, right? Mm -hmm. The uh, Carinia brevis. Um, we're also starting to connect the dots between anthropogenic nutrient loading and the blooms, but it's a really complex process, right? I mean, it, it, it doesn't occur in the same spot every year, um, and we don't necessarily know where it initiates, right? Well, I was just talking about potentially from the seafloor. Um, colleagues of ours, Bob Weisberg at USF, published a paper a few years ago that basically sort of back calculated in time where those organisms would have come from based on where they bloomed if they initiated from the seafloor um, and sort of came up with the idea of a seeding area offshore. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, as far as, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't categorize it necessarily as a ticking time bomb, but I would say if we don't, if we're not, if we don't remain cognizant of our nutrient loading to our, our local waterways, it could potentially exacerbate harmful algal blooms for sure. So a lot of people, right, kind of look at like people like the sugar cane industry, right, specifically like Okeechobee, right, how all these nutrients are kind of just released through their dike system, right, in South Florida, there's a lot of the current system takes up the Gulf of Mexico, which some people say causes red tide, mm -hmm. right. A lot of people are very quick to kind of blame that culture industry and those sort of people. Um, but you're kind of saying that there's not necessarily 100% merit to that. Am I interpreting that correctly? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of nuance there. I mean, yeah. Uh, as a scientist, we have to be as conservative as possible in the way that we approach those questions, right? Um, we kind of have to remain agnostic, so to speak, until we see evidence to point us one direction or the other. Um, and so right now, I mean, there's, there's no scientific direct relationship between the nutrients that were released in the Okeechobee waterways and the blue algae, blue-green algae on the East Coast or red tide here. Uh, that I can say definitively. Um, I also can't say definitively that it wasn't the cause, right? So we're, we're working on that right now. <laughs> but we have to connect those dots very uh, slowly. It usually takes a lot of time and a little bit of money. Um, but we, you know, exhausting every possible explanation to kind of knock off the ones that don't make any sense. And if that's the only one that remains at the end, then that's the most likely cause, right? Um, so I mean that's that's kind of our job as scientists is to test all of these hypotheses, and if one of them doesn't pan out, if the, if the evidence doesn't support it, we can throw that one out and kind of whittle our way down to the one that's the most probable. Um, and so, it's possible that that was the cause, or it's it's likely that it was probably uh, it probably exacerbated either the, the the longevity or the magnitude of that bloom, um, but I can't say that definitively. Yeah. Yeah. It's just an interesting perspective, which is why I ask. Um, so, uh, if you uh, kind of transitioning to your work with uh, eDNA, right, and kind of this um, in your research, can you start? Can you explain what eDNA is and how it's been prominent in your research? Yeah. So, um, well, yeah. So the eDNA work is uh, primarily with uh, colleagues in Australia, mm -hmm. um, and so this ties in our work in the Pacific Ocean. Um, so we're working with a, a large group of folks um, from, what, five different countries. It's an international collaboration to try and set baseline measurements in this area of the Pacific Ocean called the Clary and Clipperton Zone. So it's between Baja, Mexico, and Hawaii. Uh, and the reason that, they're, that we're doing this is, in, is because this area is of interest for deep sea mining. There are what are called polymetallic nodules, um, which I have one over there if you'd like me to show that yeah, too. Okay. <laughs> I've got a couple of them. All right. So these are polymetallic nodules. Um, they form over the course of millions of years on the seafloor, uh, essentially by fluid flow through the sediments on the seafloor. So the chemicals that that water leaches from, from the sediments uh, comes back up to the surface and then precipitates out on 
usually like a pearl. There's a, a central grain in here. So in some cases, you'll find like the central grain's a shark tooth, which is really cool. It's really rare, but it's possible. Um, most of the time, it's just a clay grain that this thing has grown gradually on over the course of tens of millions of years. So you can see some of the inner, inner workings here. Um, but uh, yeah, so these are, are distributed um, quite, uh, yeah, in quite high abundance in this area in the Clarion Clipperton zone. Um, and the reason that they're interested in these is because they're enriched in uh, several elements that are useful for making batteries and electronics. Um, so, yeah, nickel, uh, cadmium, cobalt, uh, yeah. So <laughs> lots of lots of things that you can you can make electronics and batteries out of. So there's such a high demand for electric vehicles and that type of thing now. It has become economically viable for us to go collect these things. You know, 5,000 meters, 15,000 feet below the sea level, right? Three miles below uh, the sea surface. Um, and so they're interested in collecting these these smaller ones simply because there's they have. Uh, uh, industrial hoppers that work with this size of nodule. Um, they're not necessarily interested in the large ones, so we usually use those as the show and tell. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, but yeah, so the, to directly answer your question, uh, we are trying to set all of these baselines, including environmental DNA with colleagues in Australia, uh, so that we know what's happening now. We know what the normal is, right? These areas have never been explored before, so every time we pull something up, there's usually a new species or something that's new to science in that wow. collection. From a scientific point of view, it's yeah, it's really really exciting. Um, on the flip side, the the, the management side, <laughs> um, you know, we're trying to provide information, uh, especially for the International Seabed Authority, which is the regulator in the area. Well, it's the regulator, you know, in all of the high seas um, for for mining purposes and fishing purposes and everything else. Um, for them to make a decision on whether f folks should mine a certain area, uh, if they do mine that area, where within that area they should focus on, uh, where they should leave as a preservation area, that type of thing. So we're trying to provide, again, just like we did, we're doing with the oil spill, trying to provide this information, feed it to the managers um, so that they can make informed decisions. Uh, I have a question. So can that be used like as an alternative to lithium instead of mining lithium? Would that be like a maybe a possibility to do? To um, so these are typically uh, all of the elements that they're interested in using in here are, um, yeah, so the uh, what the electronic vehicles are predominantly lithium ion batteries or um, sorry. I'm going to forget which, which one it is. <laughs> I've been talking too much about this. Um, but yeah, so the, uh, let's see, yeah, cadmium, cobalt, nickel, lead, all of those are usually used as, as um, uh, cathodes or anodes in batteries, right? So not necessarily instead of lithium, um, you know, because it depends on the type of battery that they're specifically targeting for electronic vehicles, right, or electric vehicles. Um, but it would definitely supplement that industry, for sure. Um, you know, a lot of the discussion really with deep sea mining, I mean, there are a lot of people that are absolutely completely against it, um, which is fine. <laughs> you know, um, my argument is, is that we need more information to make a decision either way. Um, it comes back to the comment about harmful algal blooms, you know, we just don't know yet. Uh, and so a lot of scientists are, are calling for a moratorium on mining until uh, I think 2030. Um, I, you know, we just, we don't have all of the answers yet. And I think, I haven't signed on to that moratorium um, because, again, I don't have enough information to make a decision one way or the other. <laughs> uh, but we're, we're, this is kind of exciting, though, because, again, since these areas have never been explored before, we're starting to develop those answers. We have more information than we ever have. Uh, and without the interest from industry, we would not have the funding to do so. Um, and so that part is exciting for me. Um, what ends up happening in the end, I'm not so certain about. You know, how much of it will be mined? Will some people are uh, of the mind that deep sea mining will never happen? Um, but uh, there was actually a resolution that was put in by the country of Nauru uh, to fast track approval for mining in the next year and a half uh, in the Clarion Clipperton zone. So more than likely, it will probably occur sometime soon. Um, the degree to which they mine, I don't know yet. So, and, and what information they have in hand when they do so, we'll try and get them as much as possible. <laughs> and, 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 uh, are there any f significant early fundings you've kind of been seeing that you're particularly excited about? Yeah, we, uh, we literally just um, 
submitted our first report in December. Um, so it's hot off the press. <laughs> uh, preliminary findings, I mean, we're basically looking at benthic foraminifera. Uh, we have a meeting in a week or two with all of the other collaborators to try and put some of these, these individual data products together, get a more cohesive picture of, of how the system functions. Um, but preliminarily, what we're looking at is three different classifications of biozonation, meaning different places to live, different ecosystems, even in an area that looks fairly the same, homogenous, right? Um, you have areas with a lot of nodules or type two nodules this size. You have an area of very few nodules or nodules like this, type one nodules. And then you have an area with no nodules at all. Um, and we're finding that these actually provide habitat for a lot of organisms, right? Our highest densities of forams and some of the other organisms that our colleagues are working with are found in areas where you have high density of these nodules. Um, and so not only are you going to go down and potentially stir up the, the sediment, create a, a cloud of, of, of dust, so to speak, like a sediment plume, um, but you might also be removing the organism's habitat, right? So these areas that are, are, are highly biodiverse, that's one of the considerations, right? Those are the possible uh, impacts. Um, and so we're hoping to go back, you know, once they do some of the, the collector tests uh, to see where that sediment ended up uh, and also to see, you know, how much the removal of the, the, the nodules actually decreased the, the amount of organisms down there. And you did kind of mention, right, that like, uh, like you're finding a lot of kind of new species, people are finding a lot of new species, right? So do everyone know what type of plants or animals really kind of live down there, right? Right, right. Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, up until probably, what, five or six years ago, at least for these areas, um, there had only been one or two studies wow. uh, ever, right? Wow. <laughs> um, there were some similar areas in the Peru uh, basin, so just off the west coast of South America, um, where they had done sort of a disturbance test before. Um, but that was really all we had to work off of. So that was in the 70s. They have recently returned to that site and found that, you know, uh, 30 some odd years later, that uh, a lot of the microbial systems had not returned to normal. Um, most of the larger organisms had not recolonized that area. Um, you think about these, these really deep sea areas, all of the, the metabolic pathways and, and um, the recolonization efforts, if you want to put it that way, move very slowly, right? Um, and so their response times are not quick. <laughs> uh, so that's another thing to keep in mind. But um, yeah, you know, the, the folks that are, that are advocating for, for deep sea mining, um, there are some compelling arguments on the other side too. Uh, the fact is that you know you have to use a lot less bulk material uh, to produce the same amount of metals if you use nodules, as opposed to taking a chunk out of a mountain, right, and refining it down to just the tiny bit that you're interested in. These are much uh, have a much higher enrichment in the metals that people would like to, to use to mine. Um, on land, you typically have to strip mine, right? So you're cutting down the forest, you're, you're just basically releasing a lot of the, the carbon sequestration that would happen uh, in that forest. So we're thinking about CO2 and, and methane, greenhouse gases. Uh, folks would argue that it would take less, uh, would make less of a carbon footprint to mine these off of the seafloor than we currently are to mine them on land. Um, and then as we were, you'd mentioned earlier, there's the humanitarian uh, implications too. So in many cases, uh, you know, a lot of these um, these metals are currently mined in uh, in areas where the the people are not paid the way they should be, or at all in some cases. Um, and so this was a heavily uh, this this industry of, of deep sea mining is heavily invested in, um, and the people that would be mining them would be compensated accordingly. The ocean is the largest, but and this might be wrong here though. Um, the ocean is one of our largest carbon sinks, though, right? So it's like, by disturbing kind of that, but the bottom, right? It's like I would imagine that's where all the carbon is stored. So wouldn't that kind of have an issue? Yeah, well, that's one of those big question marks, right? So, you know, we're focused on some of the more immediate uh, impacts and responses to the organisms that live down there. Yeah. The next level of that is all right. If we, you know, uh, mine a large swath of the Pacific Ocean how much of those ecosystem services, basically things that supply us with the things we need, right? So oxygen, food, whatever it may be, um, would that impede the Pacific's ocean, Pacific Ocean's ability to sequester carbon, to ultimately regulate climate, uh, potentially 
producing oxygen, right? Because algae is the biggest producer of oxygen on the planet, right? So exactly. If that affects algae populations, that's always going to be another issue. So, uh, right. yeah, um, it seems like there's quite a few unknowns um, with this type of work, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So then kind of time, though you work with the Pacific, um, in the Pacific, right, you have kind of more kind of local examples, right? So how do you connect those two kind of things? Um, if that makes you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So, um, the connections between some of the, the shallow water coastal work and the deep water work are predominantly through the tools we use um, and some of the analyses that we do. Um, and it really has, there are a lot of corollaries. So I mean, a lot of the, the impact and response trajectories that we see in the deep ocean uh, are very, very similar to those that we see in the coastal zone, right? Um, the major differences between the two are the fact, well, we've I've already mentioned this, is that you know the deep sea usually is a slower turnover rate. The processes there are usually on a slower, longer time scale. Coastal, it, things happen quickly, right? <laughs> um, and so generally the scales of time of that impact and response are a little bit, uh, you know, they, there's a faster pace in the coastal zones, but we use a lot of the same tools. We use foraminifera in all of different species, but same, you know, same analyses of that organism, that type of organism. Uh, in all of those environments, so useful bioindicators, um, and also the you know the collaborative efforts, you know finding folks that that are uh, experts in many different fields, bringing them all together. It's another thing we found. There's a major strength in having, you know, a, a diverse group working on a single issue. Um, it's it's a very effective way to work. <laughs> um, the other learning outcome that we had uh, in all of the environments, coastal and deep sea, is that um, if you can sustain measurements, right, for a long period of time. You can have sort of hypothesis-driven monitoring or, or research efforts. Those are the most valuable things we can do right now uh, so that we know what the natural variability is. So if a disturbance happens here, if, if there's a like a wastewater treatment emergency or offshore, if there's an oil spill or deep sea mining, whatever it may be, um, we know what the natural variability is and what the other stressors are. So when that happens, we can actually quantify the impact, right? And the, and the recovery. And a lot of folks think that you know, we as private, or individual scientists and a lot of the managers are doing that in a way so that we can sort of quantize the penalty, the financial penalty for private industry. The reality is um, it could work in their, their favor as well. We would essentially assess that there may not be an impact, right? So Deepwater Horizon, in many cases, we couldn't assess an impact because we didn't know. Um, but if there were areas that we surveyed that we're pretty certain were not impacted, that were, may or may not have been included in some of those settlements, right? So we would be able to, with those long-term time series uh, and monitoring effects, or monitoring programs, um, be able to fully assess whether this area was impacted or not. So whether it's in the deep sea or shallow. So kind of circling back, Larry, to your work of eDNA, right? It's like, a, if I'm understanding, you're able to take a sediment core, right, and then since you look at the DNA, um, you know, every single organism right produces you know hairs or different kind of things, right? You're able to take a sediment core and essentially understand what type of species right live in the area, right? So if a red drum of a scale, right, you're able to understand that there's red drum there, right? Um, what to kind of discuss that a little bit more and uh, why that's important? Sure. Um, so, I mean, I, I am uh, just getting started in my eDNA uh, research. I mean, again, primarily working with colleagues, but. Um, Essentially, what you do is you take you can take a sample of in the in the ocean, take a sample of water, uh, or take a, a sediment sample, um, and you basically uh, sequence and a, uh, amplify all of the the DNA in that sample, right? And so, in some cases, in some ecosystems, we have what they call you know genetic banks, where we know all of these genetic codes, and we can assign whatever we find in that sample to a specific organism or a specific group. So we get a pretty good idea of the relative abundance of different groups using just that one sample of DNA, right? And it's multiple things. It could be all of the DNA that's in that sample, so all of the forams and all of the larger critters and all of the fish and whatever else it may be there. Um, and so it's a really, again, a, a really useful monitoring tool. You can see the change in community structure, right? Multiple trophic levels all at once through DNA. Um, the challenge now, especially for the, some of the deep sea environments that are lesser known, is that those genetic banks, those those reference codes are not there yet. And sure. so that's what we're trying to fill in right now. Cool. Um, yeah. 
So you could keep the band. You could keep uh, just building on it as you go, right? Uh, yep. Whatever you're finding, uh, and and right now, would you say like uh, like fifty percent of those samples you you already have coded, or you know what's the DNA of that, or like how much percentage do you, on a sample do you usually get that it's good that you know what it is versus what's not? Yeah, that so that would be a better question for our, our colleagues in Australia as far as the percentage that's known. I can speak to the fact that you know a lot of coastal zones simply because they're more easily sampled. Um, we have you know much higher percentages of those banks filled. We know a lot more when we when you run a uh, a sample, you get a lot more hits from that that identification program in a coastal zone than you do offshore. Uh, in the uh, deep areas of the Gulf of Mexico with the oil spill, we were somewhere like two and five percent, right? <laughs> Even in our own backyard in the Gulf of Mexico, we knew very very little. So you knew nothing. <laughs> and so, deep sea Pacific is less than that, probably. Uh, well, there's yep. so much to learn. Then that's what it means. So much that we don't know yet. Right, right. So, I mean, you can you can ascribe some of the larger groups, right? I mean, if you know if you know um, generally, you know, a foram is different than a shrimp is different than uh, a red snapper. You can assign larger groups like that, but getting down to species. the genus and species level is more difficult. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, have you applied this eDNA to understanding recovery efforts um, as a result of red tide, or? No? I have not personally. Okay. No, no. I know that there are folks working on it. I know that the the harmful algal bloom group at FWC is working on that, um, but I have not worked with that personally. No. Um, cool. So. Uh, um, do you have any questions about that? Yeah, I think just at this point, uh, where do you see all this research going in the next uh, 15, 20 years? Um, I mean, it's just... Yeah. Um, it <laughs> there's a lot of focus, especially in the deep sea communities, on what is going to happen with deep sea mining. Uh, I think, you know, if that moves forward, that will ultimately be a long-term monitoring focus for a lot of, uh, you know, uh, private sector and uh, independent scientists, right, some academic scientists um, for 30, 40 years, if, if it goes forward. Um, there's also currently uh, an effort, it's called the Seabed 2030 Initiative. Um, so this is run by JEBCO in, in Japan predominantly, but it's an international uh, cadre of scientists trying to map the oceans uh, at really high resolution. Uh, so this is in the interest of you know security, it's also in the interest of um, we have maps like this for other planets, but we don't have it for our own ocean. <laughs> um, so it'd be nice to know what, what's on our own planet as well. <laughs> but you know, when you're thinking about practical applications, you know, last summer one of our U.S. nuclear subs ran into a seamount in the South China Sea that we didn't know was there. Yeah. Right. Um, and so there are some very practical, you know, high-dollar applications to actually having a detailed map of the ocean. Um, so that's in the next, well, now eight years. That should cl conclude in 2030. But it's crazy to me, though. I mean, before about three years ago, uh, five to ten percent of the world's ocean had been mapped at that level. Um, we're now close to twenty because we had started the, the not we, but the the larger scientific community had started that effort. Uh, you know, in in the what 2018-19, and will continue through 2030. So, um, so those are two large, you know, sort of global projects that are that are ongoing. Um, trying to think of, I mean, there's there's a whole bunch of like minor. Uh, not minor, but smaller, smaller uh, research efforts that I think are really promising right now. So, but a lot of it, a lot of it comes to sort of universalizing the approach from you know from continent to continent, how we monitor things, uh, how we are able to assess impact and recovery. Um, I think you know the European uh, Water Framework Directive is a really good one to to use as a model. They have essentially set up. A, a very easy to understand, relatively easy to produce uh, grade for every water mass in Europe, or in the European Union countries, I should say. And if they go below a certain level, that municipality has to spend a certain amount to get it back up to a healthy level. Um, I think it's a really healthy way to go about it. <laughs> um, and so, you know, we've, we're using some of the same marine biotic indices that that were developed in that interest for other locations around the globe. I think that's one of the things that you might see develop. Um, with foraminifera, with some of the other larger critters um, over the next 10, 15 years as well. Cool. What would you tell the general public? Um, what can they do to help? Um, like, I mean, not pointing fingers, like going back to like uh, Basilios was talking about Okeechobee, the companies, sure. but rather, where should the attention be at from the general public? 
Um, so the other, one of the, the, the other things that we're uh, sort of studying in the background um, is our microplastics, um, which are pretty much ubiquitous. So it's kind of funny because we're funded to do projects in the coastal zone for harmful algal blooms, deep Gulf of Mexico for oil spills, and offshore for mining in the Pacific. In all of those samples, we find plastics. <laughs> you know? um, and so I think the one thing uh, that people can do is probably limit their use of single-use plastics. I know there was an effort to eliminate straws, but that's just one. If it's coming in a plastic cup, it's the same issue. <laughs> so um, I think that's the one thing that people can do is limit their use of, of, of single-use plastics. Uh, in addition to that, you know, the through through my work with the harmful algal blooms and and, and in the Manatee River. Um, you know, be really cognizant of using fertilizers on your own lawns, right? Uh, when it's extremely, well, yeah, it, it's, it's probably best, um, you know, not to fertilize your lawn, <laughs> you know, if you can. I understand people like green grass. Um, that's, you know, that's fine. But uh, be cognizant of, of your use of fertilizers. That's a major one, so. Would you, um, I mean, if you, Feel free to not answer this, but would you argue that microplastics are a big issue than, say, red tide, or would you say those are just two different issues? Two compounding issues, yeah. Okay. So, I mean, the more and more we study, the more and more we realize that we, you know, we're funded, again, to focus on one stressor at a time. Uh, but the more more we're learning is is it's always sort of a... Double way, yeah. Yeah, a tapestry of, 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 uh, of stressors. Trying to, especially when you're working at, like, impact and response, um, to disentangle those is difficult. So I wouldn't I wouldn't say that one is more important or more impactful than the other. Um, we know a little bit more about the impacts of red tide uh, than we do about microplastics at this point. Um, but that doesn't mean that that's necessarily less impactful. We just don't know enough yet. So. And I guess the way we would just end, end this interview. Um, if you have anything else to kind of say, what do you have to? Um, do you have anything to say to anybody that's listening? Right? Any kind of final thoughts you'd like to kind of get out there to the world? Wow, that's a tough question. <laughs> um, I mean, it, it, oh, man. Any research you want to plug? Or <laughs> well, you guys have already asked me about all that. Yeah, so um, no, as far as research plugs go, I mean, the, the yeah, we've gone through all of those projects pretty much. Um, yeah, I, you know, I think it really comes down to not only our, our personal or individual um, a sort of responsibility to do some of those things, right? Reducing our, our use of plastics and uh, maybe decreasing our use of fertilizers, especially certain times of year. Um, but also the main thing is, is is to keep people interested and involved, right? These large disasters garner a lot of uh, a lot a lot of news coverage, a lot of interest, um, and they, you know, quite frankly, we learn a lot more about the natural environment through them because everybody's interested. You gain funding that way, but. Um, you know, keeping people interested on, you know, the sort of less attractive monitoring programs and the importance of those. Uh, you know, I, I just want to draw people's attention that those are the most important thing we can do uh, as scientists, as, uh, you know, people that are managing each of these ecosystems. Um, and even, you know, like I said, this also benefits private sector folks, right? Um, you know, the companies that, that may be or, or not responsible for that impact um, can benefit from those programs as well. And quite frankly, a lot of our private industry in Florida, uh, recreational and commercial fishermen, uh, they all benefit from having those long-term monitoring programs, right? Uh, our tourism industry is contingent upon healthy beaches and a, ha and a healthy ocean, right? <laughs> for the most part. Uh, and so I would argue that uh, you know it's important for people to, to support those types of programs because that's how we keep those, those things healthy. Cool. Yeah. Well, unless you have anything more to add, yeah. I think that was. Well, that's that the, conclude. Yeah, I think that concludes the interview. I thank you so much for your time. Absolutely. And I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks for, thanks for being here. Thanks for having us. Yeah.